Hey, Joseph, what's on your mind today? Hello, how are you? Very good. How are you today, Joseph? Yes. Um, forgive me for asking, but I, I don't know who I'm talking to. I, I apologize. This is David Anders. Hi, David Anders. How are you? Hi, I'm fine, thanks. How about you? Um, David, I... <clears throat> I uh, try to make this as fast as possible, and uh, I've never, you know, called a radio show before, and there's a reason for that, particularly when it has to do with, you know, religion. David, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I'll be very honest with you. I, I'm 61 years old. You know, my my life is almost over, really. And ever since I was 40 years of age, I've had this, I've had this doubt in my mind about, and forgive me for saying this, but about God and about, about heaven and about all those things. And uh, it's bothered me for so many years that I, I've not, I haven't been able to enjoy my life because for the last 20 or 30 years, I know that the end is coming. I, I sometimes hate myself because I can't be like everybody else. Just get up in the morning, go through life, and go go to bed at night, and that's it. No, not me. I, I have to dissect everything. I have to know what's going to happen down the road. i got to know where what's coming. I, oh, yeah, that's me. I have to know. And I... Nobody, Joseph. Joseph, I, I, you don't have to, you don't have to pipe him down, but we can have a conversation. I, I am, I understand where you're coming from. Boy, do I ever! And I am so sensitive to the struggle that you're going through. Uh, it's one that I've gone through. Um, I think it's one that many people, not everybody, but a lot of people have gone through. And I want to start. I'm going to have to go to a break in just a second, but don't leave. Okay. I want to start by saying this: that the 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 incredible psychological need that you have for understanding, right, for a kind of intellectual reconciliation of your life to reality, all right, that that desire is what we call the desire for God, right? That longing to know, all right? St. Augustine, one of the great saints of the Catholic tradition, says our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O God. Now, some people find themselves restless for status. They find themselves restless for sex. They find themselves restless for money. All right. But, uh, and they may never give a thought to the big questions. But I think the deepest rec- restlessness that we can have is that restlessness for reconciliation with the absolute. All right. And then your recognition, right, that it escapes you, that it escapes you. Well, that is the human condition, right? That is the great, the, the tragedy, the irony, the agony of humanity's spiritual condition. Now, what, what does the Catholic faith have to offer you in that condition? Okay, well, first of all, first of all, the Catholic Church validates your feelings and says that they are right and correct, and, and, and nor, it is as it should be. You should long to know. You should long for reconciliation with the absolute. Okay, now, what can we give you to 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 palliate that that spiritual and emotional wound? Well, first of all, let's talk about who God is. The Catholic Church has a very sophisticated idea of who God is, and so sophisticated that I'm going to wait till the other side of the break to speak to it. But stay with us, Joseph. I I can't control the break. The music comes and I can't stop it. Just stay with me. Glad you could join us for the Tuesday edition of Call to Communion here on EWTN. Before the break, uh, David was talking with Joseph in Palm Bay, Florida, uh, trying to get things settled in in his mind about a number of items. So Joseph um, has doubts about the existence of God and Mm -hmm. the contents of the Christian faith, and the, the doubts and the questions torment him. As And he's not alone in having this kind of an experience. And so I, I wanted to provide for him, first of all, a framework for th- just thinking about these questions. And I think one thing that's very important to get on our heads is when the Catholic Church talks about God, what, is, what does that mean? What does the word even mean? All right. 
And one thing that it does not mean is it doesn't mean a guy with a white flowing beard and a staff sitting on a throne with lightning bolts coming out of it. Right, that's, a, right. that's a Greek pagan idea of God. My favorite definition of God in the Catholic tradition comes to us from the, the Fourth Lateran Council in the 13th century. And the council simply divides, defines God as the first principle. Now, we all know what a principle is if you've ever studied geometry. You know, the axioms of geometry are those, those principles from which the, the various conclusions and arguments flow. Mm-hmm. I mean, a principle is that from which something proceeds. Okay? And by, by defining God as the first principle, what the Catholic Church has done— and of course, this is a definition that she got from philosophy. No, yeah. all right, all right. So you you see, the Catholic Church has always had a deep respect for philosophy and science, and 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 the rational understanding of our faith. She's really told us very little about the interior life of God, very little about the nature of God Himself in Himself, but a lot about God's relationship to the world. All right to say that God is the first principle is to say that reality, the world, the stars, the moon, the heavens, proceeds like an effect from a cause. Not necessarily uh, limited just backwards in time, but even in the here and now, that like, you know, I'm looking at Tom Price, and I know that there's a cause of his being right now. I mean, the, 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 the atomic structure of his cells, the laws of gravity and, and, uh, and physics and so forth that hold him together as, a, as, a, as an entity— uh, you know, the electrical impulses of his brain. All of these things stand in need of explanation, all right? And I can sort of drill down to deeper and deeper deeper levels of analysis until I come to that fundamental level of analysis upon which the whole bedrock of, of reality rests. And that's simply what the Church means by the word God. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you, well, well, what is that thing? How much can I know about it? Well, not a whole lot, but some things, all right? Some things. One is that it can't be any physical cause. It can't be any physical cause, all right? Um, and, and, uh, and it can't be made of parts, you know, like atoms are made of parts. It can't be made of parts because it can't depend on any kind of composition for its existence. So I'm looking at something that's, that's simple, non-complex, that explains the reality of all things. Okay? That's what we church means by God. Now, that's an idea I can wrap my head around to a certain extent, and, uh, and I think that the denial of such a God makes reality unintelligible. Well, if reality doesn't proceed like an effect from a cause, well, then, it, then, then there's, there's literally no way I can coherently explain it. All right, and then I've just destroyed my ability to know anything. Mm-hmm. I, why you know, I wouldn't know that you know, Easter bunnies wouldn't just pop out of hats in seconds you know, if there was no intelligibility to the world. But it is intelligible. I experience is it intelligible, right? In that sense that there's a cause that lies behind things, that's what we mean by God. Now, I want to tell you a story, a story about a saint, Catholic saint, named Josephine Bakita. Bakita was not a philosopher. She was not an educated person. She was a slave in the Sudan in the 19th century, all right? She was a black slave who'd been captured by uh, Arab traders from the north and, and had been sold and resold and sold and resold and abused and beaten. She had no education. She had no family. She didn't even know her own name. All right? Didn't even know her own birth name. Had a horrible life. Just terrible life. Mm-hmm. Uh, until she was redeemed, bought out of slavery by an Italian diplomat who was visiting the Sudan. And, and he brought her back to Italy where she encountered the Christian faith. Now, she had an interesting response to the Christian faith. She tells us in her autobiography that when she was a slave, she used to go out and look at the sun and the moon and the stars and marvel at their beauty. And she said that she pondered who made these beautiful things. And she was filled with a desire to know the author of these beautiful things in nature and to render him homage. So this is a person with no contact with Christianity at all and who recognized from the physical world that there was an order of explanation, that there was something that made reality understandable and intelligible, and she longed to know it, you see. She longed to know it, all right, just like you do, Joseph. Then when she encountered the Christian faith, she recognized that the God of the Christian faith, she recognized that the God of the Christian faith was, was equal to, was answered to the description of that unknown God for whom she longed. Like the key fit her lock, 
you see. Yeah. All right. And she went, okay, that's, that's the one that I was looking for. All right. But she learned some things that she could not know in reason. Namely, that she was loved by that God and awaited by that love. And thus she said, my life is good. Now, no atheist could say of Bakita that her life was good. She had a horrible life. Yeah. But she could say it because she could view her whole life in light of that sense of reconciliation that she received by faith. And you see her faith and her reason were working together. Her reason told her there was an explanation. There was an order of intelligibility. Mm -hmm. Faith came along and answered to that description. Now, is faith a leap in the dark? No, it isn't, because there are good reasons for faith. Reasons like the miracles of Christ, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the miracles of the saints, the holiness of the saints, all of these things, the, the fulfillment of prophecy. All of these things are evidences for the credibility of the Catholic faith. Reason tells us there's an order of intelligibility. There's a reason. There's a purpose behind reality. Our hearts long for reconciliation with that reality. Jesus Christ comes representing himself to have come from that, from that reason, from that divine reason, which is God. He proves this to all men by rising from the dead, by founding a church that has done more to advance science, philosophy, human well-being, hospitals, schools, uh, relief work. I mean, has done more in the realm of human benevolence than any institution ever in the history of the world, all right, is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, all right, has produced the saints in all of their holiness. These are sufficient motives to make an act of faith in divine revelation, all right? Now, the final reconciliation, the longing of our hearts— with 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 uh, with that than which nothing greater can be conceived doesn't come in this life comes in the next life that's something i can't demonstrate to you philosophically but it's what the catholic faith teaches it's what christ represented so my faith my reason they work together they point me towards that transcendent horizon where that longing that you have for cosmic reconciliation will finally be fulfilled all right, it's pointing you down the path. Now, Joseph, I don't want to leave you with no resources. All right, the questions you've raised are profound. They're the great questions of human existence. Oh, They're yeah. what have fired philosophers and religious leaders for the whole history of the human race. Okay, but I, I think, uh, honestly, I think that the way forward for you is twofold. One of them is intellectual, and the other one is spiritual, and those things are not contradictory. Spiritually, I think it's important to pray to go to Mass, to receive the sacraments, to live the faith generously, even in darkness, even in misunderstanding, even in scrupulosity, all right? And at the same time, I think you need to feed your intellect, all right, to, to help yourself understand more and more how your act of faith in divine revelation can be rational, can be sensible, can be intelligent, okay? And so you need to begin to expose yourself to some of the Catholic intellectual tradition, all right, and and to some of the thinkers that have thought through these issues so brilliantly over the years. Now, yeah. I don't know if you're a reader or not, so I'll give you some books, but I'm going to give you some non-book resources also. One of the ones that we have on EWTN often is uh, is Father Robert Spitzer, all right, um, Father Spitzer's Universe is the television show Great that's show. broadcast on EWTN, mm -hmm. where Father Spitzer's whole apostolate, his whole ministry, is based on showing the reconciliation between the faith and science, for instance. Okay, So get a hold of some of the podcasts or watch some of the archived videos of Father Spitzer's Universe. And you may pick up one and say, this isn't really relevant to my situation. Well, then go watch the next one, you know, and go it's, watch the next one. And it's also on EWTN Radio on Friday evenings at 8 o'clock. Okay, there you go. There okay. you go. So that's that's one resource. The The Thomistic Institute, the Thomistic Institute, um, run by the Dominican friars from the House of Studies in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. has a series of podcasts that they put out, deep, deep intellectual engagement with the Catholic faith and issues from evolution to neuroscience to political events and getting a, a very, very well-formed, well-thought-out intellectual approach to Catholic engagement with these kinds of issues, showing the coherence of faith and reason, and not only the reasonableness but the, but the fruitfulness of Catholic faith 
in dialogue with contemporary culture. Thomistic Institute, another great resource to begin to explore Catholic intellectual life. If you are a reader, if you are a reader, if you've never read the Confessions of St. Augustine, all right, um, you got to go read that book. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking somebody who had the same challenges that you had. I quoted him earlier in the show. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O God. He was a scientist. He was a philosopher. He was a great intellectual who wanted to know how he could make an act of faith that was rational. Begin to read the works of St. Augustine, starting with the Confessions. All right, And all along, you're making all of this a prayer. This is a cry. This is, a, this is, a, this is an ask, if you will, from God to come in and help it make sense. All right. And, you know, you said you're 61, your life's almost over. It's not almost over, all right? It's not almost over. Uh, and 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 that this motivates you is right and just and true. So let's take that motivation um, and let's plow into it and let's accept that as a good thing, that longing you have for God. That's a good thing that God put in your heart. That's a gift. It's not a curse. Yeah. Even your suffering is not a curse. Your suffering is a gift, all right? Because you're motivated in depth in ways that, you said other people are not motivated. Well, that gives you some, uh, some, you know, the purpose of life is not necessarily subjective happiness, sub, like the subjective state of well-being, all right? I mean, nobody in the Gulag archipelago, nobody in a Nazi concentration camp could think for a second that the purpose of life was a subjective state of well-being, all right? The purpose of life is reconciliation with the divine, and that often takes place, only takes place to a certain extent, through this kind of longing, this kind of angst, this kind of